Good morning, men of Calvary. How are we doing this morning? Hope you were awake now, this time. Right, but after eating, man, it's like nappy time. Right? Uh, always a privilege, right, to be here and teach the word. So uh, we've had some awesome messages already. Uh, where is it, Kirk? Kirk had an awesome message of worship. You know, uh, it's just part of, of, of who we are. It's part of us being, you know, being part of the Lord, you know, the worship and thanksgiving, to trust the Lord, you know, or everlasting Lord in everything that we have, you know, everything that we do. And then to continue, to continue the theme of, of being sold out for Christ, you know, with Brother Anton, you know, what a contrast, right? Sold out or sell out or sell out. You know, if you ask anybody, uh, you know, just flat out, hey, man, are, are you a sellout? Of course you're going to say, well, no, I'm not a sellout. Yet, but each day with our actions, you know, that might speak a little different. You know, and that's something that we have to, as Christians, evaluate constantly. The Bible constantly says to evaluate our lives, or right? evaluates. But the point of being sold out, like, you know, no reserves. I love that. No reserves. Giving it all out, you know, until like, like an athlete. Giving it all out to the very end, you know. Uh, and I love the, you know, the hard life. The hard life is not necessarily sad life. The easy life is not necessarily happy life. How true it is. Because, you know, you, you, the pain-free Christian life doesn't exist. Man, he couldn't hit it more true on the head. You know, a pain-free Christian life does not exist. You know, I'm... Not picking on the generation, but, you know, I grew up in a different generation, and some of the generation kids, you know, they get hangnails, and that's it. They're done. I need five days off. You know, you're like, really? I mean, uh, you know, some, some of the things, and, and no matter what trial you're going through, whether you're, you know, Hector, you're in Mexico, man, you're in the front lines, or, you know, you're kind of just sitting in the office, you know, and the boss just yells at you, and then you fall apart. You're like, hey, wait a minute. The, the, the stress is still real. The stress is still real in your life, and that's something that we need to deal with as Christians, Right? So to, to think that, you know, God's going to, you know, hey, I'm going to, you know, just walk in, in a bed of roses and sing the Partridge family, right, all my life. You know, I, that's, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. You know, so the pain-free Christian life, I love that, doesn't exist. It says, I can't control the wind. Where's Anton? I can't control the wind. This is so impacting. I cannot control the wind, but I can control my sail, he said. I can control my sail. Meaning that we all have a choice. We all have a choice in the matter. You know, when you wake up every morning for God, you know, does the devil say, oh man, no problem, no sweat, this guy's no problem. Or is he scared? Like, holy cow, this guy's awake now. You know, what's he going to do? We all have a choice. We all have a choice in what we do and in the decisions that we make. And, and sometimes we have to dig real deep to figure out why did I... You know, there was a time in, in, in my walk where I had to figure out, why did I just snap at my wife? Why did I just snap at the kids? What for? Is it their fault? Or is it me? Is there something inside me that's still not, not fixed yet? You know? Which is more proof that I need more Jesus every day. So that, that, that so we continue the theme of being sold out. You know, I have a title for my message, right? It's life or death. Life or death. And, and sometimes we, we go through life and, you know, we're like, man, it's impossible. I'm sorry, but uh, it's just too hard. I, I can't do this. Yeah, we have examples in the Bible, right? We have Peter, we have Paul, we have Timothy, you know, and many others. You know, I, I gave the church, everybody, a copy of the Jesus Freak book, you know, and, and to see that those guys there, you know, it, it is possible. It's not impossible. We have examples constantly, you know, showing us, you know, when we read, it's possible. You know, something true that I always bring up, you know, in our generation, Columbine High School, a gun to her head. It's possible. It's possible. And Paul, here in the second part of Philippians, we're going to see it continues to be possible if our focus is on the right place. If we've made a decision already in our lives, this is what I'm going to do. 
So let's continue this. And I'm going to start in verse 18, you know, just for context. Because 19 is like right in the middle of a sentence. So we're going to start it for context. It says, what then, he says. What then, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, he says, I will rejoice. And this is where we pick up, verse 19. For I know, he, he, he's already made a decision. I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with the full coverage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. You know, when I was studying this passage, you know, I realized, you know, that this is not the first time, as Pastor Anton mentioned also, this is not the first time the Church of Philippi has heard the gospel message. It's not the first time. It's been, well, what do you say, 10, 12 years? It's been 10, 12 years since they heard the gospel message. So it made me wonder, you know, because I, I have a lot of questions that I'm, I'm going to leave with you that only you and God can answer. And this is one of them. Where were you 10 years ago? Where were you 10 years ago? You know, I, some of you I know, you've been a Christian for a long time. Some of you I, I, I you know, don't know you as well, hoping to get to know you a little more better. You know, but we're all at different places in our walk. I understand that, right? But we all have the same time. I wake up every day, so do you. We all have the same time frame. So where were you 10 years ago? What have you done in the past 10 years? You know, we, we, the men started a book, you know, Made for His Pleasure by Alistair Begg. Awesome book. We just started. We're in chapter two, and it's so awesome. This is something he said that really struck me. He said, we should not assume that we are spiritually fit because we feel we are. I may feel that on the strength of my jumping ability, I am ready for the Olympic trials. However, when my vertical clearance of three feet is held up to the qualifying standards, I discover how far I have to go. Hmm. You know, faith, you know, the, the church is going through the book of James. And boy, let me tell you what. You know, you have to wear a face shield when you come to church now um, during the book of James. But, you know, faith is like a muscle. You know, the more we work out, Right? Not, not this, right? Hey, easy, guys. Right? Not this. I'm talking about your faith. You know, the more we work it out, the stronger and the healthier it will be. You know? But if you don't, it'll grow weak, flabby. You know? Sure, it may look big on the outside. See, some guys are huge, man, but they can't carry a, you know, a cup of water 10 feet. You're like, dude, really? You know? It may look good on the outside, but in the inside, really, it's feeble. You know, without stamina. That's crazy, right? You know, we need to exercise. <laughs> no names, right? No names. Um, we need to exercise our faith. All right? Something that we have to do. And, and it needs to be on a regular basis. You know, because, you know, if you haven't figured out by now, you know, your walk with the Lord will be tested. There's no pain for your life. There's no pain for your Christian life. So it is going to be tested. Our faith, you know, God doesn't, doesn't test our faith to make us miserable. Although, you know, we probably feel that way in the beginning. When we don't realize what God is trying to do, it may feel this way, you know. But he does it because he's trying to do a work in us. You've been chosen. You've been chosen by the creator of the universe. He's trying to do a work in you, you know, and he puts us through a workout, you know, to see where you are in your faith. Where are you? You know? 
So, you know, and as we go through this workout, our faith should increase. The stamina of our faith should increase. Strength of our faith should increase. Thus resulting in increased confidence and assurance in him. Let me tell you what, if, if you don't step out in faith, you know, you're never going to see the power of the miracles we just, we just saw. You're never going to see the miracles of God. You know, you need to step out in faith. And Paul had no, no problem doing that. Absolutely none. Notice in, in verse 19, Paul says, I know. I know, he says. By definition, this word means to be aware of, but it also means to understand. I understand this. You know, in other words, to be mindful of it to a point of comprehension and to the point of action. Not just I learned this, I understand this. If you understand something, then you don't have no problem doing it. Right? It shouldn't be. So it's at a point to where it, it, it turns into action. So Paul believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was going to get through this situation. You could, you could just see the confidence. You know, I said, man, I, I have no problem in this. Prison again? Man, if some of us went to prison, man, freak. <laughs> you know, I was talking to Chris. You know, he's in the prison ministry. I tell you, some, some of us, man, if we go to prison, forget it. You know? <laughs> Myself included, probably would cry like a baby. You know? And Paul, this is like, eh, I'm in prison again. Watch God do another miracle. Watch. Just watch. He didn't let it stop him. He didn't let it slow him down. His trials and tribulations was just something that he knew that God wanted him to go through so that you can build your faith in him. So Paul believed beyond a shadow of a doubt, right? That he's going to get out of prison. How? How's he going to do this? How did he know this? Right? By his own merit? By his own strength? By his power? You know, he said, no. No, that's not what he said at all. He said, through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. He said that I'm going to get out of here. He didn't say if I'm going to get out of here. He said I am going to get out of here. Total confidence, right? Total confidence in the Lord. He said, I am going to get out of here by one, your prayers. Your prayers. And two, with the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to tackle prayer here first. S.D. Gordon, a lay minister, wrote this about prayer. He says, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Mm. Prayer is one of the most easiest things to do for a Christian. Really, you just sit and talk to God. It's one of the easiest things to do as a Christian, yet it's one of the most lacking in a Christian's life. You're like, man, that doesn't make any sense. Why is that? I'm sure you've heard some of these sayings before. It says you can tell how popular a church is by who comes on Sunday morning. You can tell how popular the pastor is by who comes on Sunday night. But you can tell how popular Jesus is by who comes to the prayer meeting. Hmm. Been there. Always lacking. Always lacking. Prayer is one of the evidences that we are God's children. You know, that we've been born again by the Holy Spirit. It's one of the most powerful weapons that we have against the adversary, the devil, who wants nothing more than to separate us from God. He knew he can't take our soul away. You know, we're, we're right here in God's hands. He can't do that. But what he can do is ruin your testimony to where you're ineffective anymore. That's his job now. Make sure you don't tell nobody. And then they don't tell nobody, and so on and so on. To be ineffective for Christ, right? William Cowper says that Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. 
like Pastor Anton said yesterday, the, the one that's insignificant you think you are? No. Satan himself trembles. And the weakest of the saints are upon his knees. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Okay? Keep alert. All perseverance makes supplication for all the saints. David Jeremiah said, Prayer is the way you defeat the devil, reach the lost, restore a backslider, strengthen the saint, send missionaries out, cure sickness, accomplish the impossible, and to know the will of God. And we don't think this is significant to do? Prayer says, or Paul says, with confidence and assurance, you know, part of the reason that I'm going to get out of here is because my brothers and sisters in Christ are praying for me. I'm like, well, no offense, but, you know, i got to rely on you guys to pray for me while I'm in prison. I'm like, wait a minute. Paul says, well, the whole church of Philippi is praying for me. And all the saints, all the saints as well. You know, the church of Philippi refused to leave one of their men behind. Refused. Derek Prime, right, says this. It says, a Christian who neglects corporate prayer. This really hit me hard. A Christian who neglects corporate prayer are like soldiers who leave their frontline comrades in the lurch. Hmm. Being a military man, man, that's not cool. You depend on the people that are next to you, the foxhole next to you, the foxhole next to that. You're depending on people to hold your back. You're depending on your brothers and sisters out there in the field, in the battlefield. This is what Paul was saying. I said, hey, I have other comrades out there who are sold down for Christ, and they're praying for me. That was the confidence that he had. So this raised the question for me again. Who is praying for you? Who's praying for you? Anybody? Hmm? And two, who are you praying for? You praying for your pastor? I hope so. You know? I hope so. Or the missionaries are out there in the field? Or praying for your neighbor to get saved? Praying for somebody in the church that's sick? I hope so. So prayer, right? The church of Philippi refused to leave one of their men behind. Paul had the other confidence and assurance in the help of the Spirit of Christ. This, this is the Holy Spirit. It's none other than the Holy Spirit, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Right, John 14, 16 through 18 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give to you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, though. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So if you're a born-again Christian, you know, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your, not only your Savior, but your Lord, being that servant, Pastor Anton told you, that slave, then you should understand or be made aware of that the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. And he will be with you forever. You know, not a, not a second goes by where he's not with you. Convicting you, guiding you, teaching you. Supplying all your needs, you are never alone. Never alone. No matter where you go. Paul definitely, definitely knew this, right? His confidence was in the help of the Holy Spirit. And that word help meant to support. The support of the Holy Spirit. The provisions of the Holy Spirit. The supply of the Holy Spirit in what he gives us. 1 Corinthians 
2.12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. So Paul's confidence was in the provisions in which the Holy Spirit provided for him. Now, don't misunderstand me, right? It's not like Paul ran out. Like, you know, like, like run out of a cup of sugar. Hey, man, can I have more, more of the Holy Spirit? Man, I'm missing some. Can I have some of yours? Like, dude, no way. Even if that were true, you'd be like, get your own, man. I, I need all I can get. You know, that, that, that's not what he's saying there. He didn't run out of the Holy Spirit. Right? It, it wasn't like that. You know, like, hey, God. You know, wouldn't you be a pal? Fill me up, right? You know? No. Nothing like that. That's not what he was doing, right? You cannot get more of the Holy Spirit in you than what you already have. The Bible says that the saints have already been equipped. You're equipped to do any, any and all work. Oh, I couldn't be a missionary. Well, I guess you just said God's a liar, I guess. Oh, I can't serve in the children's ministry. Uh, uh, God's a liar? Really? God's already equipped you to do everything, every work. The slave's heart, right? Where do you want me to serve? What do you want me to do, Lord? You know, opportunity's there. Well, I have none to do. The opportunity's there. It's always there. Whether it's in your church, in your home, you have a, you have a ministry, 24-hour ministry. You married, children? You, you have a ministry right there. That always requires work. Always requires work. You can't get any more of the Holy Spirit than you already have, right? You either have them or you don't. And that's pretty much it. You either have them or you don't. If you're a believer, you have them. If you're a non-believer, you don't have them. You know, Romans 8, 9 and 10, 9 through 10, says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. In fact, or if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead, because of sin, the Spirit of life, because the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Right? So we have the Holy Spirit, right? We have an endless supply of the Holy Spirit. Paul had it, and he was going to need it. Right? Look at Galatians 5, 22 and 25. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit, this is our supply. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, which means long-suffering. So boy, Paul was putting that one in overtime. Long-suffering. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Man, I had to put that one in there, right? Self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions or desires. If we live by the Spirit, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. He's equipped us. All right? So Paul was, was saying that, we, you know, with the prayer for my brothers and sisters and the boundless provisions of the, of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, I can focus not on my current situation, but focus on the spiritual and be like-minded with Christ. This is how Paul got through. He was never focused on his own situation. Even, even in, the, in the first part of, of, of uh, Philippians, you read, he's praying. But who, who is he praying for? He's praying for his church. He did not at once say, Lord, please get me out of here. Lord, please, I can't stand this. Get me out of here. No. He's praying for the people of the church because I'm not there. All right? And then he's relying on their prayers. Pray for him as well. Confident that. What's your church doing, man? You're in jail. I know what they're doing. They're praying for me. They're on their knees. They're on their hands and knees praying for me. Paul knew. You know? How else do you think Paul could be joyous, you know, and rejoice in prison? You know, his only concern was that, that he might never be ashamed of the gospel. That was his concern. Just because I'm in prison, you're like, oh, man. Like Pastor Anton said yesterday, oh, man, what a waste. He was such a good pastor. Man, now he's in prison. Oh, well. You know, he blew it. No, no. Even in prison, right? Prison couldn't stop him. I'm right in the grave couldn't stop my Lord. His only concern 
that he never might be ashamed of the gospel, and that he might always have a fearless and outspoken witness for Christ. He rejoiced. He rejoiced in the gospel. He rejoiced when they preached the gospel. And you know, in the very beginning part of, of verse 18, he rejoiced. It doesn't matter how you, how you, you bring out Christ. You know, I remember a story when, when the kids were little, right? We went to a park, and uh, there was a bunch of gothic people there. You know, we were sitting in a park, minding our own business, you know, having a good time. You know, we were just very young in the faith. And there was a bunch of gothic people there, and that man, their music was like, oh, man. You know, dressed in black. Some of them had the long capes and, you know, these jackets and everything. And they're like, man, dressed in black. And you're like, man, look at that. There's one home to bring to mama. I'll tell you that, man. You know, I was telling the boys, and, you know, one of the boys... I happen to hear the music. They're like, Dad. And I was like, what? I'm like, Dad. He goes, are you listening to the music they listen to? And I'm like, what is that? It was Awesome God they were listening to. It was like, oh, I'm an awesome God. You know, but I, I couldn't understand it. But I was like, oh, you know, oh. My, my sons are like, yeah, way to go, Dad. You know, <laughs> you know I was like, I, you know, like, Lord, I'm sorry, you know. I don't care how you preach the gospel. That, that, that's it. If that reaches to them, then that's it. Paul was happy. Skateboarders, they have their own thing going on, man. They're, they're there, right? But don't make a mistake. I, I made that mistake another time, but I'll tell you another story. Yeah. He was a big guy on a motorcycle, man. I'm like, yeah, there's one. Another one life. On the back of his church, said, Bikers for Christ. Oh. <laughs> Again. You know, man. I tell you. As long as you're preaching the gospel, the true gospel, the true Christ, not, not like the Mormons and the Juvies, no, 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 not like that. They're not preaching the right Christ. That's not what Paul means. As long as you're preaching the true God and the true Christ, one spirit, one God, creator of the universe, that God is what he's talking about. You know? That's what we're talking about. Well, that's what he was talking about. You know, that's why he was joyous, you know? Then he says a statement that really puts all of his faith into perspective. He says, but that with the full coverage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. No matter what the outcome of the court case is going to be, right? The, or the imprisonment might be, whether he's going to be freed or he's going to be put to death, his desire was that Christ should be magnified in his body. You know, if you think about it, right, a Christian should not be feared death. It's a win-win situation. It's a win-win. You know, meaning that Christ is going to be honored, right, praised by others because of his service, because of his witness, because of his testimony, because of his bruised body. God, God will still be praised while he's still on this earth. You know, magnify him in my body. Death cannot stop him. One commentary wrote this, how Christ can be magnified by our bodies in life, magnified by lips that bear happy testimony to him, magnified by hands employed in the happy service, magnified by feet only too happy to go on his errands, magnified by knees happily bent in prayer for his kingdom, magnified by shoulders happy to bear one another's burdens, magnified in our bodies by death, bodies worn out in his service, pierced by savage spears, bodies torn by stones, and bodies burned at the stake. Magnify our service to the Lord by life and by death. We don't give up at the very end, right? We, don't, we just don't give up at the very end. Paul knew that he was going to get out of prison one way or the other. Either way, it's a win. It's a win. So then we go on to verse 21, right? 21. It says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know, there it is again, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, 
so that in me you might have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So Paul comes to a conclusion, you know, which, which I believe, you know, he made a long time ago, right? That, that we should have, that every Christian attitude should have, right? This eternal perspective. An eternal perspective. What does it mean? What does this mean to have an eternal perspective? You know, the world can strip you of everything on this earth, you know, that people can consider valuable, right? Money, fame, power, status, you know. If you're stripped of all that, will you still love and follow Christ? That's the question. You know, lost my house. You're still going to follow Christ? Lost my car. You're going to follow Christ? Lost my dad. You're going to follow Christ? Lost somebody dear to you. You're going to follow Christ? What's going to stop you from following Christ? That's what you need to ask yourself. What, what is it? Is there anything? Because if there is, you need to get rid of it. You need to figure out what that is. You need to get rid of it. Because the devil's going to use that. He knows. He's going to use that against you. So Paul, you know, he could care less about those things, right? Because none of those honor Christ. None of them are going to honor Christ. Paul's sole purpose in life was to follow Christ. Paul said that, you know, if I'm going to be here on this earth, if God's not going to take me in this prison this time, he didn't take him the first time, you know, and we found out, right, because we, we have the whole book, right? We find out he still don't take him. He's going to go on again. But at that point, he didn't know. He said, you know what, if God's going to take me, you know, he says, man, by all means, that's, that's awesome. But he says, if he's going to keep me on this earth, then it's back to work. Back to work. Fruitful labor. Fruitful labor. Preaching the gospel to unbelievers. Discipling. Encouraging the church. But if things go south, he says, and I don't make it out of here alive, then to die is gain. That's a hard perspective to understand. To die is gain. That word gain means to profit. He's going to profit from dying. You're like, how could that be, man? Paul, preacher of all preachers. Uh, you know what? They're going to honor me through my death. You know? What did we learn earlier? You know, that, hey, you know, if I'm not here, the church got stronger. Did you, did you catch that in the very first part of the Philippians? If I'm not here, the church got stronger. If I'm not here, it's going to cause you to pray more. Hey, if I'm not here, it's going to cause you to walk my, you know, uh, have a walk worthy of the gospel. Hey, what's it going to take? That's the question. What is it going to take? Paul says, if it takes me dying, hey, that's better for me anyway. But if I'm going to be here, it's back to work in service for the Lord. The prophet from death, you know. We don't really normally think of death as one of our games, you know. The outlook today seems to be the opposite. You know, we live to live is earthly gain. That's what the world thinks. To live is earthly gain, and to die would be the end of gain. That's what the world teaches. That's it, man. Your time's up. That's it. Had your chance. No, Paul says no. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Right? Who doesn't want to be with the Lord? Right? That's the question. You know, who doesn't want to be? You know, to die is to be with Christ and to be like him forever. You know, to be finally away from the presence of sin. Oh, man. That's hard to imagine, too. Revelation 21.4 says, He will wipe away Every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. For the old order of things have passed away. You're like, yeah, that sounds great. A commentator said this. To the Apostle Paul, death was not a darksome passageway where all our treasures rot away in swift corruption. It was a place of gracious transition a covered way that leadeth to the light. That's what Paul's attitude was. You know, death is, is something that 
You know, me and Joe were just talking about this. Death is something that, that everybody on the earth must face. Since the time you were born, you started moving in that direction. It's death. You know, but death doesn't have to be a scary thing for believers. It doesn't have to be. I've heard you, I'm sure you've heard this saying, right? To some people, this is the most heaven they'll ever see. But to others, this is the most hell they'll ever going to see. Amen. Amen. You know, that's us. Wherever we go, I mean, we're here on this earth. You know, the worst we'll ever see is, is here, is on this earth. After we die, no more pain, no more sorrow, only Jesus. You know, Paul struggled with this, believe it or not. He struggled with this. You know, my heart says one thing, but my mind says another. How many times have we been in that same situation? My, 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 my mind says another thing, my heart says another thing. My heart says, you know, it would be far better to be with Jesus in heaven. But then he thinks about it. He says, what about all those people who haven't heard the gospel yet? Last I checked, there was 8.9 billion people in the world. You know, I think it's gone up since then. That was an old statistic. Billion people. Paul truly had a heart and a mind like Christ. Second Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow, not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish. This is the heart of God. Not wishing any would perish, but that all should reach repentance. To have a mind of Christ is to all to come to repentance. Paul was never the one to think of himself. Never. As, you, as we just read in the first chapter. Verse 22, it says, or verse 24, excuse me, says this, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. There he is again. It's not even for my benefit anymore. I'm thinking about it. It's for yours. It, it is it's better it, to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy in the faith, so that in me you may be amp ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. You know, after studying this, I found out that, you know, many of us could, could relate to this, what, what Paul is going through in life at, at this point. You know, have you ever caught yourself saying that, Lord, come quickly? Lord, just come quickly. Come right now. It would be good. Have a Bible study, all the minutes together. Yeah, Lord, come right now. You know, he caught us doing the Bible study. You know, Lord, come now. I'm ready. I'm ready. Then you stop and think, wait a minute. I still have family members that are not saved. Hello? If the Lord were to come, what happens to them? I have friends that are not saved yet, coworkers. You know, then the list starts to build and build and build. And you're like, okay, never mind. Never mind. Don't come right now. Paul said the same thing. You know what? It's better. It's better if it's necessary. It's not even better. It's necessary for me that I stay because there's still work to be done. That's the eternal perspective. To realize that there is nothing more valuable on this earth than the human soul. You know, look around. You know, the only thing worth putting all your time and effort in are you guys in the seats. Everything else is going to burn. Everything else is going to go away. Everything you own is going to be somebody else's one day. Keep building that treasure because somebody else is going to have it. Can't take it with you, right? What's the old saying? You've never seen a hearse or, or a U-Haul. Um, yeah, a U-Haul. Follow a hearse. <laughs> you can't take it with you. It's not going to be somebody else's stuff. It's going to be in the trash. It, it's, those things are not eternal. You are eternal. So th where do we need to invest our time in? You guys. Or whoever needs help. Whoever doesn't know the gospel. This is, a, this is where we need to put our time in. Paul knew that. It's necessary on your account. So Paul is convinced now that, you know, 
that he would not be put to death at this time. Because he knew, you know, we believe that, that, you know, since he was walking in the Spirit, you know, I, I believe that the Lord just kind of showed him. He said, hey, well, you know what? You're not going anywhere yet. You know, he was able to give him that knowledge because Psalm 25, 14 says, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him and he makes known to them his covenant. God will let you know if you're walking with him. If you're not walking with him, man, I tell you. You know, you might be, might be walking through a bed of nails or, you know, whatever. Knowing this, knowing that he will continue the fight with them, he makes this one request. Stand. To stand. Verse 27 through 30. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and to frighten and not frighten in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign of them, of their destruction, but your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for your sake, granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer in his, in his sake. Engage in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. You know that word worthy means fittingly, it means properly, it means as is due. As is due. Right? Common. Common word, right? Fittingly, properly, as is due. But the word, your manner of life, listen to this. It really struck me, especially with everything going on with our government and everything. It says that your manner of life, it, it's a political word. You know, it means your, your constitution. Not our country's constitution. What is your constitution? What is your system of government? Your right of citizenship. That's what he's trying to say. Live a life worthy of your right of citizenship. So first we have to establish where's our citizenship, right? Ephesians 2.19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens. Fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. You belong to God. You're a citizen of him. Your government should be here. I, I heard of somebody put on, on Facebook a video, you know, and it was that, 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 I don't even know what her name is. It was that lady from uh, the war room. You know, she was speaking, right? And um, there's one thing that she said. Um, she said, you know what? Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't ride the, the backs of donkeys and elephants. All right, with everything going on in the world, I've never seen so much hatred in this world. And it is by, by the election and by what everything's going on. It's incredible to see. You know, it just tells, just reminds you which, which way we're heading, right? Right? Jesus is coming soon. But she said this. She goes, you know, Jesus, Jesus didn't ride the backs of donkeys and elephants. You know, he didn't come to choose. He didn't come to this earth to choose sides. He came to take over. That's what he did. He's coming to take over. You know, he, he became not only your savior, but your Lord as well. You know, the problem is we don't want a Savior. You know, or no, no, we want a Savior, but we don't want a Lord. I don't want no one to control my life. You know, I want to do what I want to do. You know, when Paul started this book, he called himself a servant, a slave. You know, what a popular message, right? You go to college for four years to be what? Slave. Hey. Yay. I've heard parents, I've heard parents say to their kids, Mom, Dad, I want to be a missionary. Your parents say, what a waste of a life. Four years in college, all that money, and you want to go off and just be a missionary. Oh. Mm. That's hard. That's hard to swallow. First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, 
honor God with your bodies. To have a worthy life, you must understand that since God is exclusive ownership of you, it implies complete submission. Complete submission means renouncing all other masters. Having only one master means total dependency. And total dependency means personal accountability. Because while we're on this earth, we are his representatives. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God, making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled or be reconciled to God. You know, the more time we spend with Christ in his word and fellowship and servitude and worship, the more we should conform to our master's perfect, pleasing will. If we're not spending time with the Lord, I'll tell you what, you're not going anywhere. I grew up in the faith saying, you know what, if you're not moving forward, then you're backsliding. It's that simple. If you're not moving forward in Christ, then you're backslid. But I haven't gone. I'm in the same place. Oh, okay. Right? Case closed. That's it. If you're not moving forward in the Lord, then, then you're backslid. Alexander McLaren, a Scottish minister, he says when we're, when we're conforming to our master's will, he says it's the blending and absorption of my own will with his. That's awesome. Of my own will with his. Paul had the master's will. 2 Corinthians 3 9, right? The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some counsel on us. Again, he had the same attitude, not wishing anybody should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There is no doubt that, you know, our faith will be tested and tempted. You know, one coming from God, one's coming from Satan. Tempted or tested. One builds up the faith, one tears it down. Colossians 1.10, so, so as we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit. There's our action. There's our product of our faith. It's not sitting down doing nothing. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Reading. Studying the word. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Giving thanks to the Father in, that's in thanksgiving. Who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. That's victory. That's a child of God. That is a king's kid. There's a little nutshell. We stay focused on Jesus Christ. I'm not saying it's easy. But we need to stay focused on Christ. Whether we are, we are with all the multitudes of a brother, man. That, that, that's easy. It's easy to follow Christ when you're here. Everybody's here. We're singing the same thing. We're like, yeah. Let's run through that wall. Yeah, we can do it. Boom, yeah, we're going right through it. In a heartbeat. Then you go home. It's like, run through that wall. It's like, oh, oh that's hard. Oh, oh. Oh, you know you what's know behind that wall? I'm old. You know, I'm not going through that wall no more. You know, that's how we act, you know. That's how we act. You know, standing firm is a word technology, uh, terminology. Standing firm. It's a picture of an army advancing against the gates of a kingdom and the soldiers standing firm at the gates, not giving up any ground. Standing firm. One spirit, one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by our opponents. Romans 35, 39 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, a sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long, and we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Love that. Through him who love us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen right there. Nothing. This is the type of attitude Paul had. 
Is it possible? Yes, it is. This is the attitude we need to have. Paul tells the Philippian church, as I was studying this, I noticed that Paul told the Philippian church to stand firm. He told the Thessalonian church to stand firm. Look it up. He told the Corinthian church to stand firm. He told the Galatian church to stand firm. And he also turned the Ephesian church to stand firm. Think we have a problem with this? Think there's an issue? What is the issue? Search your heart. Search your soul. What is the issue? Because once you find it, you need to get rid of it. If you notice, Jesus dealt with sin very severely. Very severely, right? On the cross. We should do the same. Find out there's sin in your life, kill it. Period. Stomp it. Get rid of it. Right? Don't play with it. Don't mess around with it. Don't entertain with it. Just kill it. Because it has one purpose, and that is to destroy you and your walk. Paul was able to stand firm because he was focused on Christ. He had spiritually minded. He was eternally perspective. He had that mind frame. All right, Paul did not fear anybody that opposed him because of the gospel of Christ. Because to live is Christ and to die is gain. He already determined that in his heart. Either way, I will glorify God. Right? You know, being a Christian is not for wimps, man. I tell you what, the more you study, you're like, man, it's not for wimps. You know, talk is cheap. You've heard some of these sayings. Talk is cheap. Put your money where your mouth is. Actions speak louder than words. Finally, you can talk to talk, but can you walk to walk? Hmm. Paul ended with reminding them that they have been granted not only to live and trust in Christ, but also to suffer for him. And as for, for me, you know, I'll just return to the same battle, right? To know, or, or the ones that I still have, same battle that I have, for one more soul and for the glory of God. One more. One more. Always remember, Christians, you are not alone. You're never, ever alone. 1 Peter 5.10. Let me end with this. 1 Peter 5.10 says, And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this, Lord, this message, Lord, being sold out, Lord, not a sellout. Lord, to see our brothers and sisters of old, that it was possible to do this. Lord, it's still possible today. Lord, through prayer, through, Lord, the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, Lord, that lives within us, that's helping us along the way. You know, we get knocked down, we get back up, and just keep going. The battle's not over yet. Lord, remind us of that. Remind us, Lord, it's all for you. We have one purpose, it's to glorify my God. Lord, I thank you and I love you. In Jesus' name, amen.